Okay, so let me point out a few things that I want you to know. So this is to sit back and relax, get to know the system. Um, this is the kidney and the things I want you to know that will help you understand why we do what we do for the kidney. So do you need to memorize this list? Not really, but you will understand all the interventions go back to these things. Here are the six jobs of the kidney. So I do have a slide on each of the six jobs about the kidney. And again, you can just kind of write not testable, but this will help you understand why we do what we do. So one, it makes pee. Great, we got that. Um, two, it regulates our blood pressure. You probably have, when you studied and you made a little list of all of your antihypertensives, which ones do you think affect the kidney? Anything that works on the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So, ACE inhibitors. What else? ARBs, angiotensin receptor blockers. Um, anything else? We've got beta blockers, ACE inhibitors. So ACE inhibitors and ARBs are your two big. And then there's also potassium sparing diuretics are also considered something that they will do for hypertension, but also affect the kidneys. So what kind of so blood pressure regulation is a big job of the kidneys, which we can see when you lose your kidneys, what do you think you have? High blood pressure or a low blood pressure? You either have one or the other. Most commonly, it's high blood pressure. But they can't regulate anymore. This whole system gets knocked out. But we tend to knock it out with antihypertensives as well. So blood pressure regulation is part of the kidneys. Water balance. So, of course, the kidneys are always involved in making sure that we stay hydrated. Um, and that is due to this antidiuretic hormone. Acid-base balance. This is where the kidneys decide how... This is our compensation system for respiratory, or if any acid base is going off. If you're acidotic or alkalotic, if the kidneys are working, they do their job to retain or secrete bicarb. Okay, they are in charge of getting rid of all of this stuff. So you can imagine that when your kidneys don't work, what are your problems going to be? Acid base. So we have a lot of issues that are common when we have a renal failure. Electrolyte balance, and they create red blood cells. They create the hormone because the kidney is a giant sensor as all the blood flows through it. The kidney can tell our blood pressure. The kidney can tell whether it's getting oxygenated, and the kidney sends out distress signals if it's not getting enough pressure or oxygenation. So it has a lot of jobs in there. Um, again, don't memorize the list. But as we go through, I will probably point out, well, we do this because we're missing one of its jobs, because it's broken. Um, this is just anatomy. You all know what ureters are. But if you don't, if you see the word ureter, it's between the kidney and the bladder. Okay. The bladder itself, um, this is kind of nice to know. It's not needs to know, but it's nice to know. Um, if your patient feels like they got to go to the bathroom, they probably have a, some urine devoid. Um, basically, this is where you're sitting around in class and you're like, mm, I hope we're having a break soon. I gotta pee. You probably have about around 200, 250 in your bladder. When you're like, if she doesn't break soon, I'm just gonna get up and leave. This is where you probably got about 400 to 600. And then you got the bladder capacity. The bladder can hold even up to two liters. I've seen it stretch, but that's where we're getting to stretch it. Bladder capacity before it's getting overstretched is about a liter. So if you ever put in a Foley and drain out a liter of volume, that bladder was really full to the point that it might be getting distended. Um, what's in charge of getting rid of urine? What muscle? Do you know? The detursor muscle. It's actually at the top of the bladder and pushes the bladder down. So the detursor's at the top, and it pushes the bladder down. So some of the issues we have with the bladder are when that detursor muscle is maybe a little bit overstimulated and it's pushing a little bit too much. Maybe it pushes when there's no fluid in there or whatever. But anyway, um, the detursor muscle is in the bladder, just FYI, and um, it pushes down to get urine out. And that, urine, that muscle will go. It starts taking over all of your senses. 
the detersor sends signals like, can I go? Can I go? Can I go? And the brain's like, no, no. And finally, the detersor's like, you know what? I'm going to take over. Um, but that is what gets rid of urine. The urethra, so the ureter is between the kidney and the bladder, and the urethra is the way out. So just in case you see, you know, if you have a location of like a kidney stone or a location of an infection, that will tell you kind of where it is in the urinary tract. So don't memorize these. This is just a, you know, trip through the kidney. Um, every single kidney unit is called a nephron, okay? That's where blood exchanges with the kidney. Um, and they never, blood never mixes in the kidney. It runs alongside it, very similar to the lung. Oxygen never, blood never mixes in the lung, but it runs right alongside it and exchanges. This is another area of exchange. Um, so yes, there's the glomerulus, and this is called the loop of Henle, and then we have the collecting duct over there. Just FYI, but I made it a little bit easier by calling it kind of the bus system. So we got the red bus is blood, and the yellow bus is the filtrate. And when we are talking about where these are, the blood bus just circulates around here, and the filtrate is what's in the actual nephron, okay? And what ends up back on the blood bus goes back to circulation. What ends up in here on the yellow bus goes out to your bladder, okay? So, Whichever bus it gets on or stays on or wherever is what we're going to see coming out of our body and staying in our body. So here's what's supposed to happen normally. Is in the glomerulus, which is this guy right here. This is the beginning of it. This is where your, your blood enters a nephron. Everything gets off the bus. It's like a mom kind of sorting out a closet. <coughs> Everything goes on the floor and then stuff goes back in and stuff gets trashed. So when you clean out your cabinets, you're doing exactly what the kidney does in a nephron every single time blood passes by it. So everything gets off the bus in the glomerulus. Dumps. And then the glomerulus is like, wait, I didn't really mean to dump that. I'm going to take it back. So what it's going to do is it dumps everything out. Okay? What pressure do you need to dump things off the bus? You need a pressure of at least 90. Oh, my gosh, I wrote it up there. So if your blood pressure is 80... What is going on? Stuff can't get pushed off the bus, so does stuff get filtered into the urine? No. Not really. Um, also, it's not feeding the kidneys, which, of course, kidney cells need blood and fluid to survive. Um, but basically, things aren't getting filtered at a lower blood pressure. We need a pretty decent blood pressure to filter urine. Um, so in the glomerulus, after everything gets dumped off, that proximal tubule, that first little plateau before we go into the loop, <coughs> is involved in taking back the stuff we need to survive, okay? Oh wait, we don't wanna lose glucose. We need that. That's our energy source, so we're gonna take that back. We don't need water. I mean, we do need water. We need most of our water. We're 70% water, so we're gonna take all that water back. Um, proteins, we want those. Those are our building blocks. We wanna keep all those, so we're gonna bring those back. And most of our electrolytes we wanna keep. So what's left on the bus to get dumped out is urea, which is always a waste product. What is urea? What is it? It's waste of what? It's basically cells, whenever they're done with stuff and they're acidic products, um, it kind of all combines into this urea, okay? This is basically very acidic, like uric crystals, urea, very acidic. So this is an acidic, toxic product that we don't want in our body. It needs to go. So what do you think its lab value is? How do we know if we have it in our bloodstream? Yeah. The BUN, the blood urea nitrogen. <coughs> That's the measure of what's going to get dumped as urea. This is a lot of nitrogen component. What is uh, creatinine? Muscle builders, take it. What is it? It's extra proteins and it is extra um, products that we don't need. It's like not as usable to the body. It's, it's harder to break down. It's, it's a waste product as well. 
So we don't want to have too much urea or creatinine. We're supposed to have just a normal level of that. We have a level that's acceptable. Anything over that we don't need and the, the, the kidneys are supposed to get rid of. So this is your BUN and your creatinine, but we're measuring what's left in the blood. When we take a blood sample, we're measuring how much of this urea and creatinine are left in the blood. Most of it's supposed to get dumped. So when that urea and creatinine are too high, either the blood couldn't push it out or it resucked it back up. It's not supposed to be there. We're just supposed to keep an acceptable amount. The rest of it's supposed to get peed out. So that's how we know when these BUN and creatinine go high, that's these levels didn't make it into the yellow bus. Okay. Um, we also need to get rid of some electrolytes and hydrogen ions and bicarb and things based on what the body needs. So they're going to throw it in the bus for right now. And then we're going to throw some extra water in the bus. We don't know if we need it yet. That's for later on in the nephron. And the reason that the nephron does this is it's getting signals from the brain and the body. So the nephron has all these little nerves in it that are telling the brain set signals down, like conserve sodium, conserve potassium, conserve this stuff, conserve water. The brain's sending all these signals down, and the kidney can then sort out all these signals. But for right now, what's in the filtrate is BUN, or I mean not BUN, B means blood. So it's just urea and creatinine and then some electrolytes and water. So should we see glucose in our urine? No, we're supposed to take it all back. So if we see glucose in our urine, it's two things. We had way too much glucose that it couldn't suck it all back up, or there's a problem with the return area because we shouldn't have glucose in our urine. Should we have protein in our urine? We should not. We're supposed to take that all back, except for the creatinine. Uh, we're supposed to take that all back. So the proteins should not be in our urine. If we have protein in our urine, there's a problem up in this tubule that's supposed to be sucking it back up. Now, if you're on a keto diet and you're taking, or you're on a high protein diet, well, you have protein in your urine. Heck yeah, you got too much. If, the, if there's too much, the body will excrete extra. So there are conditions. We should not have glucose. We should not have proteins in our urine. But if you are consuming too much, then the kidney might be doing a decent job by getting rid of that extra stuff. So if your glucose level is 500 because you just had, you know, an entire, you know, cold stone creamery cake, well, yeah, the urine's going to get rid of some of that glucose. You don't need all of it. Um, and proteins, if you're on a, you know, a high-protein diet, you may be spilling proteins, which is why the keto diet measures your urine because they're looking to see, are you spilling protein? If you're spilling protein with a normal, healthy kidney, that means you're over-exceeding your protein amount and you're doing a good job. It's an assessment tool. So then we go into that big loop of Henley. And what this involved, that loop of Henley, is involved in um, water and sodium. All that loop does is balance water and sodium. So based on what your body needs, it sucks things back into the blood or dumps extra out into the bus, into the yellow bus. And then we go further into the thing, and now we do more electrolytes. It's basically balancing all along that thing from signals from the brain, okay? So what we do is we balance this bus all the way out, and then this, um, that collecting duct, all that is involved in is uh, retaining water. So as we work through that whole thing, they're balancing everything out. The last chance to pull water back into the system is in that collecting duct, and then the rest of it goes out to the bladder. Okay, so this is your chance to clean things out and filter out the system. What's left on the yellow bus goes out in the pee. So this is the blood's chance to take it all back. So I just like to compare it to cleaning out a closet. You dump everything on the floor and you put back what you want, the rest of it goes to Goodwill. And that's what we're doing in the kidney. Um, how many nephrons do we have? Millions. Millions. We can go down to about 10% kidney function before we start seeing any signs or symptoms. So you can lose an entire kidney and have no noticeable difference. That's why people can donate kidneys. We are born with extra, tons of extra. The body knows how important the kidney is and just basically triplicated everything. We've got more than we need. And then as you age, we slowly lose nephrons, things die off, things can't be repaired, but it's fine, we got an extra. 
So it takes a lot of work to, to ruin a kidney. We have a lot of them. Um, so if we have like 2 million nephrons, we can go down to about 10,000 nephrons is what we really need to survive. So we've got a lot of room to play with in there. Um, here's the blood pressure thing. Um, the kidneys respond to low blood pressure by asking for more blood pressure. How does it do that? It sends signals out, and it starts with renin. You don't have to memorize the system, but just so you know how it works, the kidney sends out renin. Low blood pressure, kidney sends out renin. Okay. The renin is then changed in this big cascade to angiotensin and aldosterone. These are the end products. Angiotensin makes blood vessels constrict. And aldosterone makes the kidneys hold on to sodium and water. So if you're holding on to sodium and water, what's going to happen to your blood pressure? It's going to get thickened up, right? I mean, it's going to start holding on, and the blood vessels are going to get plumper and plumper, which is what the kidney wanted in the first place. So this is a great system. It will squeeze down the blood vessels, and it will plump them up, and you get a nice blood pressure, right? Because you get a nice filled vessel, and your blood pressure goes up. That's all the kidney wants, is a blood pressure. It doesn't know what's going on in the rest of the body. These systems are a great picture of where communication can break down. So the kidney can send out renin as it dies. So let's just say we're damaging the kidney. And the cells are dying and kind of releasing renin when they're not supposed to. What's going to happen to you? you're going to have vasoconstriction, and you're going to have increased water retention. What do you think we see in hypertension? <coughs> increased, vaso you know, increased vasoconstriction. So if your kidney is not doing well, sometimes it releases renin inappropriately and causes vasoconstriction. So that's why renal failure and hypertension go together. Because as the kidney fails, it releases renin, and the body converts it, and then the remaining kidney is like, Okay, I'm going to retain sodium and water, and I'm going to close down those vessels. I'm going to constrict. And so sometimes renal failure and hypertension go right along because something is killing the kidney, the kidney releases renin, and so that's why we give angiotensin receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors for hypertension and renal patients because we're trying to block that system. So we don't choose these things. The doc chooses these things, but that's why they're choosing them. So what angiotensin receptor blockers and ACE inhibitors will do is stop this process, stop the vasoconstriction, and stop you holding on to water and sodium. So what are you going to do? If you're not holding on to water and sodium, what are you going to do with it? If you take an ACE inhibitor or an ARM, what is going to happen to your urine output? You're going to pee. You're going to pee. You're going to lose sodium. When you pee out sodium, you retain potassium. So ACE inhibitors and angiotensin receptor blockers are also known as potassium-sparing diuretics. Have you ever seen those signs and symptoms? Or those, um, uh, what, oh, God, what am I looking for? Well, if you look up an ACE or an ARM, what is your side effects? Increase potassium. What else? Probably increase urine output. Angioedema. Well, angioedema, that one's a little harder to explain because you're supposed to be peeing out. But most ACE inhibitors and ARBs can be classified as potassium-sparing diuretics because they help you pee a little bit and you don't retain as much. So you can see where that would be very helpful in someone that... Um, is useful as well. Now, if you have kidney failure, this may not work fully. You have to balance things around. But I just want you to know that angiotensin, if you see renin, angiotensin, or aldosterone, that's involving blood pressure and kidney. If you want to take anything off this page, I don't need you to know how it works. Just know when you see <coughs> renin, angiotensin, or aldosterone, that's involving the kidney. Okay? And that's involving blood pressure regulation. All right, so here's a big picture of how it all works. Too much. All right, um, there are things called prostaglandins that they use to decrease blood pressure. 
Um, the only takeaway I want you to know off of this slide is guess what a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory does? It blocks prostaglandins. And so guess what the kidney can't do? Stimulate a lower blood pressure, which ends up causing hypertension to the kidney and damages the kidney. So non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are bad for the kidney because they block this process. That's all I need you to kind of pull away from that. Um, Anti-diuretic hormone is the brain, and we will talk about this again when we do endocrine because we got two endocrine problems that work with this hormone. Um, but anti-diuretic hormone, what is it sending a message to the kidney to do? <coughs> it's an anti-diuretic hormone. Retain water. So if the brain sends out anti-diuretic hormone, what is your kidney going to do? Retain water. If the brain does not send out anti-diuretic hormone, what are you going to do? You're going to pee. So if your brain has been damaged and this signal is not getting sent out, the kidney's waiting. The last thing it's waiting to do is balance water at the very end. It's waiting for that signal from the brain. And so if it doesn't get the signal from the brain to concentrate water, and that's because the brain's super sensitive up there. It's saying, oh, my head's getting a little full. Send out, and send out diuretic hormone. We got, or not send out, we're gonna stop sending out antidiuretic hormone. My brain is getting full. I'm sloshing up here. So I'm gonna stop sending that signal. So basically it's saying, don't pee, don't pee, don't pee, don't pee. Ooh, I need to pee. So it stops sending that signal and then you release water until the brain starts to dehydrate a little bit. And it's like, whoa, hold on to fluid. Hold on, we're good. Hold on to fluid. And so it's kind of giving a stop go to the kidney about water balance. So antidiuretic hormone comes from uh, the brain, and that is another check balance on your water system because the brain's up there sensing stuff. So just because the kidney's not completely good at it, it's just reacting to blood pressure, the brain's reacting to water balance. So you've got all kinds of things sending messages to this kidney. It's a very complex system, and when it breaks down, we got a problem. Um, so the acid-base balance, basically when the body's alkalotic, it reabsorbs hydrogen ions, acidic ions, anything with a little plus is acidic, and HCO3 should have a little negative next to it because they're, uh, it's a basic ion, it's alkalytic. So see, you get to bring your chemistry in. I may have chemistry, I was very good. Um, but what it will do is if you're alkalotic, it holds on to acidic ions and releases the alkalotic ions, and if you are acidic, it will hold on to alkalotic ions and get rid of acidic ions. You're like, great! That's exactly what we want it to do. And that's what it does until it breaks. Um, vitamin D, I just need you to know that it, it does affect vitamin D. Okay? There's a whole big, a whole bunch of steps. But um, you have to use vitamin D to absorb calcium. And um, it requires the kidney to create usable vitamin D. So if you do not have a working kidney, what's the takeaway about this? What do you think you're going to have? Low calcium. You need working kidneys to help maintain your calcium balance, and that's what vitamin D does. Vitamin D, you know you have to take vitamin D with calcium. They go together. But you can throw it all into the gut all you want, but if the kidney doesn't work, you won't absorb it out of the gut because vitamin D is required to absorb it, and kidneys help process vitamin D. The more you know. So... Chronic renal failure patients, do you think they have enough calcium? No. And then what do they have? High phosphates. So you will see that this makes so much sense when we go into renal failure. So I'd just like to spend this time for you to absorb this knowledge. Um, the last thing it does is it um, stimulates red blood cell production. Because as part of that sensing mechanism and that glomerulus, as things are getting off the bus, it's sensing pressure, but it's also sensing oxygenation. Am I getting enough oxygen to do my job? If it does not, it sends out a signal for more red blood cells because red blood cells carry oxygen. So kidneys are great at sensing blood pressure and oxygenation. And they will respond to blood pressure and they will respond to oxygenation. Low oxygen levels will increase your red blood cell count by using erythropoietin. So what is erythropoietin for? Stimulating 
red blood cells, not white blood cells. That might be a test question. Anyway, um, I always like to make sure we're all on the same page with vocabulary. So if you don't have those vocabulary words down, get them down because they might show up in test questions. Okay, I want you to, I, I always get something like, what's epistaxis mean? I can't tell you that. It's a, it's a medical vocabulary <coughs> word. So I kind of put renal vocabulary words here. I try to put vocabulary words with each of the lectures so that you know. If I say your patient has glycosuria, I need you to know what that means. Your patient has azotemia, um, I would want you to know what that means. I don't want you to have to raise your question in the middle of the test and be like, you said azotemia, I don't know what that is. I want you to kind of know those words. So um, these are the lab tests. Like I said, um, if something comes out of the kidney, we want to make sure it's supposed to be in the urine. And we always kind of have to make sure that if it's dumping out of the kidney, what does it look like in the bloodstream? Is it being appropriately dumped out of the kidney? So um, blood urea, nitrogen, and creatinine are our big ones. This glomerular filtration rate is something where basically, what do you think it's measuring? What is it measuring? How much is getting dumped off the bus at the very beginning, okay? If your kidneys are not filtering, then you have a low glomerular filtration rate. That's something that they actually use, we will talk about again, in <coughs> renal failure. Okay. Electrolytes, um, these are blood electrolytes. Not, see it says renal blood tests. This is what your blood electrolytes are. This is not what your urinalysis shows. Your urinalysis should show, you know, based on if you have a low blood sodium, do you think you are dumping sodium? We'd have to look in the kidney or in the urine to see are we low blood sodium because we're dumping it all in the urine. Like if it's not in the blood, is it in the urine? We sometimes have to look at both, okay? If it's not in the blood and it's not in the urine, we're low on it all around, right? We don't have any to get rid of. But if we have low sodium in the blood and high sodium in the urine, maybe there's something wrong with the kidney, okay? So these are blood values, not urine values. Uh, we just kind of, kind of go between the two. A creatinine clearance, if you get it, is a 24-hour urine collection. This is where they basically measure all the urine for 24 hours and guesstimate a more specific creatinine clearance. You can't get a creatinine clearance from a lab value or a one-time UA. If the doctor orders a creatinine clearance, it has to be a 24-hour urine collection. So have you ever seen those big brown jugs in mice? That's what they're collecting urine for. You collect all their urine for 24 hours, and they do math and magic in the lab to give you that. Um, when you're getting a urinalysis, this is just kind of what we expect from a urinalysis. Um, and so I just want you to know, like, if you get a urinalysis on a test question, it will help you figure out what's going on. So I would like you to kind of know where things live. Like, it's not normal to have blood, ketones, glucose, protein. Like, those things shouldn't be there. If they are there, we have to look at the reason why. Is the kidney broken? Or is there something wrong with the rest of our systems? But um, these are just extra cues. Like, I'll never give you a UA and say, tell me what it means. But it will be extra cues. You know, maybe your patient has um, a fever, and then when you look in the urinalysis, there are high white blood cells and low specific gravity. What does that... Well, sorry, they would have high specific gravity. So... If they have high specific gravity, kind of like high blood osmolality, it's very concentrated. There's a lot of particles in your urine. That means that it's very concentrated urine. If it's low specific gravity, it's diluted. So it works the same as if you have blood osmolality. A low blood osmolality means very diluted blood. High blood osmolality means very concentrated blood. And the same thing goes, we just call it specific gravity. Or they have urine osmolality. Same thing. Okay. So just kind of um, some things. Somebody asked me what casts were. And this just means that basically it's white blood cells clumping together with a bunch of junk. So when you see casts in the urine, 
that's basically there's a process going on in there. And the urine is spilling out a lot of white blood cells, red blood cells. There's just clumps of junk. Um, it makes kind of cloudy urine and stuff like that. So if you see positive casts, you know you've got either an infection or some kind of trauma going on in your urine tract. So, um, but we shouldn't have things in our urine other than uh, urea, nitrogen, and electrolytes, or blood urea, creatinine, and electrolytes. We shouldn't have a lot of protein, glucose, ketones. That stuff shouldn't be there. So when it is there, we've got a problem somewhere. We have to investigate more. So it's an extra cue that helps you out. Questions? That's just like a little background. Um, so you can take that, and then you can use that information to help you apply all these problems stuff. Uh, so the first problem we're going to talk about is stones. And I'm not going to spend a ridiculous amount of time reading to you. Um, I do think this video is worth your time. It is a great video, um, about five minutes long, on how stones form. And they use the word stone formers, like you're like this big, you know, labeled population of stone formers. But um, it really talks about all the different kinds of stones and how they form and why they form and why our interventions work. I think it's a great summary video. But um, I'll let you watch that on your own time. It's about five minutes. Um, what I'm going to tell you is when you have a renal stone. Anybody had a renal stone? You want to share? <laughs> You're probably like, oh, I remember that. Um, the first sign of a renal stone, you'll probably agree, is pain. Um, great amounts of pain. Depends, too, on where your stone is. If it's in a smaller area, it causes more pain. What's the pain caused by? What's that? So it's blocking. So what's happening? It's scraping the sides as it works its way down. But what's working its way down? There's muscle contractions trying to push it out. The ureter is all of the small, all of the bowel, the urinary tract is smooth muscle. Okay, just like your esophagus, it's going to help things move. The ureter is not just a tube, it does have muscle to it. And it will try to squeeze that stone down there. So not only are you having pain from the stone scraping up the sides as it tries to move down, but there's also pain from the urine, from the contractions of the smooth muscle trying to get that thing out. Um, the urine will change color, probably, or consistency. What do you think you're going to see in it? Blood. Well, blood, because, hey, we're scraping stuff up. When we have a bloody thing, what's going to come to the rescue? White blood cells and swelling and junk, and um, that's what we're going to see, those casts coming out in the urine. It's all those white blood cells trying to clean things up and repair, but we've got a lot of damage going on in there. And why do you have urinary frequency or incontinence? Well, those muscles are just squeezing away, trying to get a stone out. So if they're squeezing away, trying to get a stone out, they might be squeezing some urine out with them. So um, you get a lot of uh, urinary frequency and incontinence because you've got a lot of smooth muscle contraction going on in this whole system, trying to remove these stones. Um, so that's how we know you got a stone. The pain is specifically colicky, meaning it comes and goes. Just like a baby with colic, it's crying, like it's kind of always there, but it comes and goes in its consistency. And then flank pain. <clears throat> Anytime you see the word flank pain, I want you to think kidneys. What they're talking about is right on the sides. The kidneys, where do they sit? They're right under your ribs. They're right back here. Okay, they're not down here. They're back up in here. So if you have pain there, it will kind of radiate all around your side. So you will have flank pain. And sometimes it radiates around, but it's flank pain, back pain, sometimes goes around to the abdomen and groin. But flank pain, I always want you to think flank pain, kidney. Flank pain, kidney. They're sitting right there. They have pain right there. Um, how do we know things are getting worse? So your patient comes into you and they say, I've got colicky pain. I've got, you know, they check your UA. Your UA has blood and casts and it's kind of cloudy. Um, and then what else? Are you going to see urgency, frequency? That's all expected. You've got renal stones. They'll probably do something to verify that you have them. How do we know the problem is getting worse? <coughs> you can't pee. That stone is blocking 
urine output. Well, the urine's still being made. The kidneys work. So that urine is sitting somewhere causing a problem. So if for some reason we have any decreased urine output and they have any reasons for stones or they have any signs and symptoms of stones, that becomes a problem we need to intervene quickly for. Um, infection. Well, we've got a whole lot of scraping going on. We've got a lot of stuff in there. We've got a lot of bleeding. Bugs just love to get up in there and clean the, and get in there and start infecting the urinary tract. So any infection of the urinary tract, and when we talk about the infection, we'll have slides on the infection. The lower urinary tract is the urethra and the bladder. The upper urinary tract is the ureter and the kidney. Okay. So an upper urinary tract infection really means a kidney infection. Um, and so we start having a kidney infection because urine is getting blocked up. The, maybe the ureter is getting scraped up and bacteria got up in there and they're just climbing. This is a straight tube right up to the kidney. They can just march right on up there into the kidney. Um, and then we can have fluid retention if the kidneys are damaged. So those are our top three um, cues and top three worsening cues. What will we look at? Well, hey, it's our GU system. Got a problem in the GU system, we need to monitor it. We're gonna watch the urine output. Since we have, if we have decreased urine output, we will need to bladder scan the patient because we gotta figure out, is your kidney damaged or are you blocked up? So if there is urine in the bladder um, and it's not getting out, where do you think the stone is? In the urethra blocking the stuff from getting out. Um, if there is nothing in the bladder, where do you think the stone is and the damage is? Above the, damage, above the bladder, probably in the ureter or the kidney, okay, causing nothing to get to the bladder. So bladder scanning is a really great idea to see where's the problem going at. Are we not making urine to get into the bladder or are we blocking the outflow of the bladder? We won't know until we look at the bladder. So bladder scan is a big one as soon as you get a decreased urine output. So as soon as you get a decreased out urine output, even in SIM or anywhere, I'm going to want you to grab a bladder scanner and look at the bladder. Because if the bladder is full, we've got an obstruction problem. If the bladder is not full, uh-oh, now we're moving up and it might be a kidney problem. Um, pain level location, of course, because it's colicky, it's painful. This is number one priority for the patient, 100% is the pain. You're going to be watching the urine and all the temperature and the fluid retention and all this stuff, but the, pa the patient is all worried about the pain. Pain hurts. So, what are we gonna do? We got a flow chart now. You have kidney stones. We do one way if you have good urine output, we do another way if you don't have good urine output, okay? If you have good urine output, then we are going to say, flush that stone out, okay? Let's get rid of it. The treatment for stones really is to dilute and get rid of, okay? Flush, 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 flush. Um, increase fluid intake three to four liters a day and give them some pain control. Hurts. Let the body pass the stone if you have good urine output, okay? So the treatment is really to fluid, pain control. They could ultrasound scan to see where it is, but really what we're doing is telling the patient, drink, 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 drink. Um, pain control, and then we're going to strain it all, and why do we strain it? Why do we want them? So you find out what they're made of, because that will help you with your discharge teaching. You don't know what they're made of, you can't tell them what to do to prevent your reoccurrence. But we're going to strain them and see what they're made of so that the lab can, can analyze them. Now let's just say you are not peeing. Well now drink, drink, drink goes out the window, because we don't really want you drink, drink, drink until we figure out what's going on. Okay, so you have a different flow chart if you're not peeing. If you're not peeing, you have renal stones. Um, you can do stuff, but we need to get urine out. So we will make sure that we will foley them. Why do we foley them? How will that help? They're not putting out urine. How will a foley help them? Well, if there's an obstruction in your urethra, it will 
get past that obstruction, we have to get urine out the best we can, okay? So most patients will get a Foley to drain urine, or if we're trying to clear obstructions, then we have a window into what your urine looks like, okay? So most patients with decreased urine output or retained urine will get a Foley. Um, antibiotics for infection. Because if we're retaining urine, where's the infection going to be? Could be in the bladder. If you got wherever you're retaining fluid is where the infection is going to be. Because bacteria love to live in that area. Even though it's acidic urine, they love all the junk that's in it. They like the proteins. They like the urea. They're, the bacteria that live in there love it. Um, antibiotics for infection. You may, you have to go in there and get that obstruction. Okay, the Foley doesn't do anything about the obstruction. There require interventions to get the obstruction out. There's shockwave therapy, which will vibrate the uh, stone into small pieces. There's a scope that you can go in and actually remove the obstruction. Um, they can actually surgically remove kidney stones. But basically, that becomes higher in your priority because we can't tell them drink, 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 drink until we're sure that the obstruction is cleared. Because if you drink, 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 what are your kidneys going to do? They're going to make more urine, and we're already got an obstruction going on. So we're going to kind of halt on the drink, 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 drink. It's still not going to, we do want them to hydrate, but only once we've either got a Foley in or we've gotten the obstruction taken care of. Okay? So if you have no urine output, you're going to add Foley and antibiotics to it. If you have urine output, they may just tell you to drink, 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 drink. Um, antibiotics possibly if there are signs and symptoms of infection. But when you have retained urine, you definitely get antibiotics. Okay? Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, I will kind of we'll do some questions and hopefully make it make sense. Um, what meds do we give them? Yes, you have a question? We're not the ones that do the... Um, oh, gosh, no. No, no, no. I'm just saying that you would anticipate those treatments. Those are possible treatments. Yeah, to fix the problem. Because, yes, there are things we can do and there are things physicians can do, but we need to ensure that those treatments are being done. It's not just the treatment to give a Foley. We need to continue down the path. Like, what's your plan, Stan? Are we going to do something about this stone? I put a Foley in and I still don't have urine output. We got a problem. If you put a Foley in and you have great urine output, maybe you don't need to go to those interventions. But. Okay. Um, so what meds would we give these patients? We said drink, 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 and pain meds. So I kind of didn't go over pain meds again. I'm hoping that you're pretty well good with non-steroidals, acetaminophen, opioids, right? Yeah. You guys got those. So if I put those up there, I don't really explain them. Um, but for the pharmacology piece, we may give antispasmodics and alpha blockers. So I would want you to know probably the most common ones so that you can recognize them if they show up on NCLEX or on a test. Um, so I would want you to be able to recognize them and tell, them what, you know, tell me what they are. I don't need you to know every single thing about it. But if you see tamulosin on your MAR, what do you think that's for? What's tamulosin for then? It's an alpha blocker and what's that gonna do? It's going to relax your urethral sphincter, which, what is that going to do? It's going to allow things to stop and start the way they're supposed to, okay? It's going to relax everything around there and help things flow. Um, somebody's like, well, if you relax the sphincter, doesn't it just pee? No, if you relax the sphincter, it keeps it from being clamped up and retaining urine. If you relax it, it's relaxing it enough to do its job, which is to stop and start flow. Um, people that have issues with urinary incontinence are because that sphincter is spasming inappropriately and letting urine out when it shouldn't. So when we relax that sphincter, it just kind of, oh, now I can do my job. And they stop it. So it doesn't make them pee. It just helps them kind of open and close the way they're supposed to. Um, Antispasmodics are going to relax the muscle of the trap. So um, it will relax all those smooth muscles around the ureter, and it relaxes the bladder. So you can see we're not going to use them just in renal stones. We're going to use them for almost any renal problem. 
Um, but what the antispasmodics do, well, they will relax the bladder, they relax the ureters, they kind of let things ooze, and when things relax, things can pass around obstructions, there's <coughs> not as much stress on the thing. So we will give antispasmodics and alpha blockers to help keep everything moving appropriately. And here's what we can do to prevent reoccurrence. We kind of need to know what the stone is made out of to tell them what to tell them in terms of your discharge teaching and what you're going to do to re-perform. Um, most stones are due to dehydration because stones form in concentrated urine. Okay, So dilute urine doesn't form stones. My mom got a bunch of kidney stones after her surgery because she didn't want to get, she had knee surgery, so my mother, being the logical person that she is, says, well, I don't want to get up and move around and go to the bathroom a lot because it hurts, so I'm not going to drink. <laughs> so guess what she got? <laughs> kidney stones. And she's like, oh, my gosh, I have kidney stones. I'm like, yeah, of course you do, Mom, because you didn't drink except, like, one glass of water. She's like, well, I didn't want to pee. Well, you get your kidney stones. So um, kidney stones form in dehydrated environments because your urine is concentrated, and that allows all this stuff to glom together in um, thick, concentrated urine. Um, so here's some of the causes. So um, calcium stones, you know, here's all the different causes, and here's what we're going to do to prevent it. Number one, any kidney stone of any kind prevent dehydration, okay? Patients should always drink, and you and everyone in the world should drink three to four liters a day. Um, I think they said it's your number of kilos is the number of ounces you need. So if you are 80 kilos, you should be drinking at least 80 ounces a day. If you're 100 kilos, you should be drinking at least 100 ounces. That's the minimum. So go home and kilo yourself and find out how many ounces of water you're supposed to drink. Well, and that's because half of your weight in pounds is the number of kilos you are. Because there's 2.2 kilos per pound. So yes, you could take your weight and divide it by half and do that. But it is your number of kilos is the number of ounces. So three to four liters a day. Three to four liters a day is a great three hydros a day. Right? We should all be aiming for that. Once we, um, especially once you are a stone former, you're supposed to be drinking a lot. Um, and then based on your kinds of stones, these are some things you can do. So I'll let you read those off. And that is kind of discharge teaching and preventing reoccurrence for stones. All right. And then basically here's how you evaluate. Did you fix the problem? All right. So I think people have been to the eyes. Um, this one, the basic UTIs, you probably have already learned a lot about just from life. Um, but I'm going to, again, reiterate the difference between a lower UTI and an upper UTI. Um, lower UTIs is uh, bladder or urethra. Upper UTI, we're starting to talk about the kidney. Okay? So when we start talking about the kidney, we worry about kidney damage. Okay? Um, an infection in the kidney starts causing damage to the kidney. Um, it causes fluid back up in the kidney. Uh, we're having issues, and we don't want upper UTIs. They are a worsening condition of a urinary tract infection. Um, one other upper UTI is called glomerulonephritis, and I put it up there as an upper UTI because it is a kidney infection, but it's a kidney infection of just a specific area of the kidney, whereas most UTIs come from the bottom up, and the infection comes from outside in. Glomerulonephritis is an infection of the kidneys, but it doesn't come from the urinary tract. It comes from streptococcus, so we'll kind of go through that. But it is considered an upper urinary tract infection because it's a kidney infection. Any kidney infection is a UTI. It's a urinary tract infection. Um, so what we're going to see with any UTI, lower or upper, are all the typical signs and symptoms of UTI. It's going to burn when you urinate. It's going to be, you got to pee right away. You've got a lot of bladder spasms going on. What happens in a UTI is the muscles get very spasmy. Bladder muscles get spasmy. Ureter muscles get spasmy. Everything gets spasmy. And when those muscles are spasmy, you end up needing to pee a lot. 
because the muscles are trying to go. Um, you get a lot of leaking of urine because those muscles are spasming, your sphincter is spasming, everything's spasming, and so you end up releasing urine when you don't want to. Um, you gotta wake up all the time to pee, um, and it hurts. I mean, I don't want you to show a hands, but if you had a UTI, you know. Um, it hurts. Um, what's in the urinalysis? Well, what you would expect with an infection. What are you peeing out? White blood cells, casts, red blood cells, because that's what is in that system, kind of cleaning things out. The infection's digging up in there, causing pain, causing spasms, and the white blood cells are going in there trying to clean things up, and so we end up voiding that stuff out. So when you take a sample of your pee, white blood cells, red blood cells, and casts are in there. Um, how do we know a UTI is getting worse? Well, you have the worsening infection, which is your kidney infection. So that's why they say if you have a UTI, you have these signs and symptoms, they tell you to go to the doctor right away because you don't want bacteria climbing from your bladder up into your kidney. It's a beautiful fluid-filled environment and those bacteria just go straight up the tube system and um, they end up in the kidney if we don't treat them before they get to the kidney. So um, with these signs and symptoms, uh, worsening cues is pyelonephritis. So if you come into, your patient comes in with pyelonephritis, they've already got a worsening cue. What's the worsening condition of pyelonephritis? In a infection kidney is a failing kidney. So we kind of go in steps that you go from just a UTI to an upper UTI to a failing kidney. And those are the steps, and that's why we want to take care of these things because we don't want our kidney to fail. It's really important. We want to preserve it. We want to save it. Um, so acute kidney failure will come after this. You're not going to have acute kidney failure and not pyelonephritis. You're going to have pyelonephritis first. Um, and then once the kidney fails and you got an infection up in the bloodstream, this is a beautifully rich environment full of easy transfer, right? There's a thousand nephrons and now bacteria are in all those nephrons in the pea part in the yellow bus they will migrate across into the red bus very easily and you can get a bloodstream infection from the kidney source so that's kind of like the worsening stages the first signs you're going to see is the kidney infection you leave the kidney infection for too long you can end up with kidney failure and urosepsis so we don't we want to treat them right we don't want all that mess that's a lot of paperwork um, <laughs> And here are your signs. So basically, pain is your big sign for a lower UTI, pain, urgency, frequency. But you will still have pain, urgency, frequency, plus high fever and chills. Why is it high fever? It's bacterial. Whenever we see a high fever, and what do I mean by high fever? Greater than 102. Greater than 101.5. 101.5 is our most common, like, Ooh, like anything under 101.5, we're like, don't care. Low grade, don't care. Not, no doc wants to hear about anything under 101.5. Over 101.5, we're like, ooh, now we got to pay attention because that's more of a bacterial fever, <clears throat> okay? Um, it could be viral, but high fevers always go with bacteria, and the reason being the bacteria multiply a lot faster than viruses, and they spike a fever much quickly. So high fevers is usually bacterial. Um, flank pain, why flank pain? Because it's in the kidneys, and the kidneys are always flank pain. Uh, nausea, vomiting, fatigue. Well, anytime you're sick, you're going to have fatigue malaise. I'm like, that's a silly symptom. Anytime you're sick, you're going to feel sick. Um, but nausea, vomiting does come, uh, kidney pain causes nausea, vomiting. Um, if you ever had kidney pain, I apologize, but you will probably feel like crud. Um, but really, high fever, chills, and flank pain are a very big sign of a, renal, of a kidney infection. Um, Glomerular nephritis looks a little bit different. All right, pyelonephritis is just the kidney being infected from the bottom up, fever, chills, flank pain. What does glomerular nephritis look like? Well, it's an irritation of the filtering system. So they look a little different. It's not from the bottom up. Um, I think the causes are... I put the causes later on. The cause of glomerular nephritis is usually strep. Strep causes glomerular nephritis. So untreated strep infections cause glomerular nephritis. It's somewhere in another slide. But let's think about we have damage to the get off the bus and reabsorb thing area. 
So what's going to happen? We dump things we're supposed to reabsorb. Number one being proteins. So the big cardinal sign of glomerulonephritis is proteins in the urine, along with a fever. The fever is a little more low grade. Um, what is the bobbly, foamy colored urine? This actually looks like Coke. You pee out something that looks like Coke. That's not okay. Um, and that can be from uh, protein. Protein makes the urine dark. Um, another cardinal sign is edema in the face. So if your patient comes to you with um, burning, urination, flank pain, and um, high fever, we're going to probably call that pyelonephritis. <coughs> if they come to you with a temp of 101 and dark cola-colored urine and periorbital edema, I want you to go glomerulonephritis. They're both kidney infections, but they're of different sources. Okay? Guess what? The treatment's going to be the same. But what do we need to monitor it? Monitor your urine system. It's a urine, it's really simple. I mean, it's a urinary problem, monitor the urinary systems. Um, because of our worsening assessments are going to be um, pyelonephritis, which is still monitoring the urinary system, but because sepsis is in there as an infection, we're always going to be watching for that worsening um, temperature plus heart rate increase, respiratory rate decrease, blood pressure are signs of a bloodstream infection. So, um, those are the things we're going to watch. If it's a GU problem, watch the GU system. If it's a respiratory problem, watch the respiratory system. Don't make life hard for yourself. Blue and electrolytes, you've got to watch a lot of stuff. But um, for these GU systems, watch those systems. Um, we want to give them antibiotics and fluid intake. That's really what we're doing. It's an infection. It's not much more than that. Give them the antibiotics they need. Um, we always want to get a specimen before we're starting antibiotics, right? They drilled that into you? If you have an infection of some kind, we don't even know where, they're going to get cultures of everything. But if we know it's from the urinary tract, they're coming to you with pain, urgency, frequency, and uh, temp, and you see stuff in the urine, go ahead and culture it, because you know you're going to start <coughs> antibiotics for it. And that's what they do if you go to an urgent care with a UTI. They'll give you antibiotics, but they've taken your urine first. They took that sample. They send it off for culture. Usually the sample that you send for UA if you come in with symptoms of the UTI, what kind of urine are they going to ask you to send? Are they just going to have you pee in a cup, or are they going to do a clean catch? If you have symptoms, they're going to go ahead and clean catch it because they know they're going to culture it. So that's why if, they did a U, if you just did a UNA, a regular catch, they would have to get another sample from you, clean catch, because clean catch means that you cleaned everything with antiseptics, and when you peed in the cup, the bacteria that are in the cup should be from the urinary tract, not from the skin around the area. Um, so clean catch urine, hopefully you did that already just to get a urinalysis, but whenever someone comes with symptoms of a UTI, whether it's flank pain, chills, fever, burning, urination, get a clean catch urine because you know your culture in that. Um, fluid intake because that will flush bacteria. Uh, the exception being low urine output. So if you have a kidney problem or a glomerulus problem, we may want to assess the urine output before we start saying drink, 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 drink. Make sure your urine output's good before you tell a patient to drink, 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 drink. Um, antibiotics and pain relief are the um, treatments. Because the glomerulus is broken in glomerulonephritis, what is the glomerulus sensing? What is its job to sense? Blood pressure and oxygenation, right? That's where the kidney senses stuff. The glomerulus is where renin and erythropoietin come from. So if the glomerulus is broken and not sensing, what is it releasing by accident? Renin, which is going to increase your blood pressure. So um, a lot of times patients with glomerulonephritis have high blood pressure as well. Was that on your list? High blood pressure, and that's why. Because the glomerulus, when it's broken, releases renin, whether it wants to or not, and increases your blood pressure. So all of them get antibiotics. All of them get flushing, unless there's low urine output. We want to make sure that we have good kidneys before we say drink, 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 and uh, glomerulonephritis will get blood pressure treatment. Um, so 
What do you think they would use for blood pressure treatments? <coughs> for a glomerular nephritis patient? Probably an ARB or an angiotensin or an ACE inhibitor. Okay, because that's what's going to fix the problem. The kidney's sending out renin. Just block it. So, see, now you, you guys are so smart. You know these things. Um, for antibiotics, I just need you to know that there are antibiotics. Um, the most common ones for a lower UTI or for pyelonephritis are there. Um, ciprofloxacin works really well, so if you have a complicated UTI, they usually will give you ciprofloxacin. If you have pyelonephritis, they'll give you ciprofloxacin. Um, for glomerular nephritis, because it's usually a strep infection, um, you'll get the penicillins. Okay, because strep responds to penicillins. Um, and we will teach patient after antibiotics. I mean, this is just generic. You should already know all the teaching points for antibiotics. Um, one thing I do want to point out is a new med that you probably never heard of again, um, unless you've had a UTI. Um, this is peridium. I don't know how to say that. Thin uh, zopridi. Um, it's the magical wonder drug that works wonders. Um, but it does not treat anything. It's a urinary analgesic. It's an anesthetic for the urinary tract. So it is available over the counter, and one of the big teaching things for patients is they'll take the peridium, because it's available over the counter as Eurostat now, and if you take it, all you do is numb the pain, but you're not doing anything about the bacteria. So guess where they're climbing? Ever north. And all you're doing is masking symptoms. So patients that take peridium without their antibiotics can end up with a renal kidney infection very easily. Did they use that with stones as well for peridium? Um, I, that's a good question. I don't know. I, it's not listed as one of the treatments, so I'm wondering if it does have something. I'll have to look at that. That's a good question. I don't know. I'll find out. I'll find out. I'm not sure if it's contraindicated with stones or not. I will find out for you. Um, but it does stain the urine reddish orange. And um, so, you know, they're not developing glomerular nephritis if their urine becomes dark and pea colored. Um, but yes, make sure that they are not taking that instead of an antibiotic or taking that instead of going to get antibiotics. Antibiotics are the only thing that will fix the problem. Um, and so I'll let you read through the cause. Oh, here's where the cause of glomerular nephritis is usually due to the streptococcus infection. So if they're coming in with um, renal failure, edema, high blood pressure, and cola-colored urine, um, there's usually a history of strep somewhere in the past. Um, I think that's about it. You can read through the causes. You should know how to prevent a lower UTI. If not, kind of get there. Uh, this is more patient teaching and evaluation. So, I will let you read through all those. Doesn't mean you don't need to know them, just you can read. Um, in terms of genetic kidney disorders, so you can imagine a genetic kidney disorder we can't do much about. Uh, they are genetic. And this is where we will see nephrotic syndrome. Have you heard of nephrotic syndrome? Maybe heard of it, maybe not. Um, there is nephritic I like to highlight the I in nephritic because that means infection, inflammation. Nephritic syndrome is usually associated with the glomerulus, okay? Nephrotic syndrome is also the glomerulus, but this is just proteins. There's no infection, no inflammation. Nephritic syndrome means there's infection, inflammation. Nephrotic syndrome, oh, overpermeable to proteins. The only sign and symptom of, or the only cause of this is that the glomerulus, for some reason, dumps proteins when it shouldn't, okay? It's a genetic disorder. My son's best friend has uh, glomerular nephritis, and, uh, or not glomerulus, has nephrotic syndrome. As a kid, he's just wasting proteins. They don't know why. They don't know if it's an autoimmune disease. They don't know if it's a genetic disease. But nephrotic syndrome means you're wasting protein. So now we got to kind of think about what does that mean? If you are throwing protein into your urine and not keeping protein in your body, what does that mean to you? What is going to happen to your fluid balance? Are proteins big and thick? Yes, they are. They're big and thick. Albumin is our primary protein, which is what gets lost in the urine. So albumin is getting peed out. It should be held in our bloodstream. So what happens if we lose our major big thick proteins in our blood. 
What will happen to your blood? Does it become thinner or thicker? Thinner. So where does the fluid go? To the tissues. So when you lose, and you'll see this again in liver problems and kidney problems, if you're losing albumin, which is the protein, you end up swelling. And the reason you end up swelling is because you lost the big, thick thing in your bloodstream that keeps fluid in your bloodstream. We peed it away. So now all the fluid just kind of disperses out to the tissues. So high amounts of protein in your urine. Um, there's no infection. The urine's clear as a bell except for high protein. Um, you have low serum. So if you drew a blood sample, where is, is your albumin level high or low? You peed it out. It's low. Low blood albumin, high urine albumin, or high urine protein. Albumin and protein are the same thing in this situation. Why do you get high blood pressure? You're like, God, why? Why do you get high blood pressure? So, it's dumping. You get for two reasons. Two reasons you get high blood pressure. You could just care that there's high blood pressure. If you're a list person, go for it. But when you start peeing out albumin, all the fluids in the tissues, what's left in the blood? Not much fluid, right? So the kidney gets a signal, I'm low on fluid. So what do they do? They retain fluid. So the kidneys are retaining fluid, which then gets pushed to the tissues. And then the kidneys get a signal, I'm low on fluid. It's like, I know how to do that. It retains fluid. And then it gets pushed to the tissues. So the swelling gets worse and worse and worse. What's happening to a glomerulus that is getting low pressure? What signal does it send out? Renin. Renin, which will increase your blood pressure. So it's twofold. It's holding on to fluid, and it's secreting renin. So you're getting high blood pressure. So this is just kind of like a bad cycle gone bad, okay? The kidney thinks it's low flow. It's not low flow, it's lost albumin. The kidney, you know, you're just, he's just not thinking. He's just not thinking. For some reason, for whatever reason, the walls are too not reabsorbing protein, for whatever reason. I think that they think it's autoimmune at this point, and they've said some kids grow out of nephrotic syndrome. But anyway, it's protein. So if you just remember, they pee protein, they don't have it in their blood, they get high blood pressure and very, very swollen. They look like little Michelin men, lots of tissue edema. What do we do to it? What do we do to it? It's genetic. They think it's autoimmune. The answer to any we don't know is steroids. <laughs> So whenever something becomes autoimmune or we have no idea, they throw a steroid or an um, anti-rejection drug at it. Because they're like, well, let's just stop it. Let's just shut the immune system down and see if that helps the problem. So patients with nephrotic syndrome will probably be on steroids or anti-rejection drugs. And my son's friend's on tacrolomus, which is an anti-rejection drug, to try and stop this process. And this, if he stops taking it, he starts to swell because he starts to lose protein. So we don't really know what's causing it. So they will treat the symptoms, which is edema, diuretics. Um, if they have high blood pressure, they will reduce the blood pressure, probably with a renin angiotensin block or something, an ARB or an ACE inhibitor. Okay. Um, so that should probably be, go ahead and add in there. Did I have high blood pressure in there? No. If they, they, nephrotic syndrome patients have high blood pressure, so we will be treating their high blood pressure. So they will get something to stop the process, which is autoimmune, and they will get something to fix the treatments. So they'll have an antihypertensive that should need to be added in there. Antihypertensives, they will get stuff to treat edema, um, which is a low sodium diet, and um, diuretics. And then I don't think DVT clot, that shouldn't, I would put hypertension on there before DVT clot prevention. I don't know if this slide's quite right. Get rid of that and put hypertension. Hypertension, antihypertensives need to be treated. So nephrotic syndrome, remember proteins. Polycystic kidney disease is also a genetic disease. Um, we can't do anything about it. It is a bad gene malformation that creates cysts in the kidneys. This is your normal kidney. This is a polycystic kidney. It's big. It's 
like carrying two babies around right up in here. So you can kind of recognize heaviness in backside or abdomen. Um, because, and then these cysts are blood-filled cysts, so when they rupture, you bleed. The, the patient basically just goes in for treatment, so frequent UTIs. They get frequent infections. They've got blood in their urine all the time. They get multiple antibiotics. Nobody really looks at it, and um, they just assume it's an infection. But they don't have this, and they get infections in these kidneys because they're blood-filled cysts. Blood-filled cysts get easily infected. Um, but really, they, don't, they have high blood pressure, periods of blood in their urine, and just a vague heaviness and discomfort in the back till someone finally does an ultrasound and is like, holy moly, look at those things. Um, it does end up in renal failure. The kidneys will fail in a matter of time. So it's kind of a sad. So if you see polycystic kidney disease, I just want you to think genetic. These patients will need genetic counseling because if it's a gene that malforms the kidneys, their kids might get the gene that malforms the kidneys. Um, the only cure is a kidney transplant. This is just a nice little picture I like of the difference between nephritic and nephrotic. And nephritic is an infection, inflammation, and nephrotic is dropping protein. Okay. I just put this in here because I didn't have anywhere else to put it, really. Neurogenic bladder, we talk about it in black flora. We talk about spinal cord injury. Um, we'll talk about it again also when we do some of the neuromuscular disorders. But if your dutricer muscle is not innervated properly, it's called a neurogenic bladder because the signal from the bladder muscle to the brain is not working. Whether it's cut off or whether it's being misread, the bladder to the brain doesn't work. It's called neurogenic bladder. So if your bladder never sends a signal to the brain to pee, you don't pee. And you can cause problems because you're still making urine, but the dutricer muscle just doesn't doesn't respond to it anymore. The brain's not sending a signal to go ahead and contract. It just becomes a big, swollen, giant bladder. It can also, the detrusor muscle sends wrong signals like, I gotta contract, I gotta contract, I gotta contract, I gotta contract. So neurogenic bladder doesn't mean that you get a big, swollen bladder or that you have an overreactive bladder. It depends on the patient. Neurogenic, matter, neurogenic bladder means both. You can have a hyperactive bladder or a flaccid bladder. But just basically that means that the nerve conduction is no bueno and um, the, the patient with a neurogenic bladder might need to be catheterized because they're not signaling properly. Yes? I had a patient with a neurogenic, he emptied two urinals, you just by reminding him to go pee. Oh, like he had to physically send the message down yeah, to pee. Yeah, he told him to say, go pee, and then he was like, oh, right. Yeah, because they don't have that signal that you all have. Like, get up and go to the bathroom. It's broken. And the reason it's called neurogenic is because the nerve system isn't working right anymore. So there's a variety of what neurogenic bladder looks like. I'm not going to spend too much time on treatments and stuff for it. But just know that it can be. If it is hyperactive, we can give antispasmodics or alpha blockers. If it is flaccid, we will intermittently catheterize. Okay? There's really, I'm not going to make you pick treatments for it. But these I want you to memorize. There are not that many of them. Um, but when you see these meds on your MAR, I need you to know that renal failure is a very high possibility. Nephrotoxic medications are toxic meds to the kidney. And I will show this slide again when we do renal failure next week. Um, but yes, you will need to know these because those cause problems to the kidney, especially a kidney that's already having problems. Do we want to give these, or do we want to watch them and hold them? We probably want to watch them and hold them. Um, everyone gets confused down here. The patients in renal failure, we've just said that they can be toxic to the kidney. Why are we giving them? We don't give them to fix renal problems. We fix them, we give them to fix symptoms like edema that are affecting the lungs. Sometimes we kill the kidney to save the lungs, the heart, or the brain. We let the kidney go. Yes, and that's, you probably know the doc, but a favorite doc will be like, dude, the kidney, we got a machine for that. Let it go. But just so you know, diuretics do not help the kidney. 
in any way, shape, or form. They make the kidney work harder, and they cause stress to the kidney. We do it to treat symptoms. We don't do it. We can kind of try and jumpstart the kidney to work it harder, but just so you know, prolonged diuretic use does hurt the kidney, okay? People think diuretics are a treatment for kidney disorder. No, they damage the kidney, but sometimes the benefit is greater than the risk, okay? We use it for fixing other symptoms before they cause problems. Right, but what are we giving the diuretic to do? To remove fluid from the lungs edema. We're removing edema. The kidneys aren't working that great. At some point, diuretics won't work. We will knock that, we will flog that kidney until it stops working. It's like beating a dead horse. We can give it diuretics, and it'll work until we've killed it off. But that's why you see people get higher and higher and higher and higher doses of diuretics until the kidney doesn't work anymore. So I just want you to know that diuretics are not the treatment for any kidney problems. Diuretics damage the kidney, but we do do it to reduce edema because the risk of edema is higher and we are aware that the kidney is dying and we're letting it die. So that's kind of a little sad story. For the kidney. Poor kidney, he gets abused. Um, I'm just going to, this is really a review. I do want to show you a couple things with my toys. Um, you know about catheter-associated infections. Um, I just want to review because there might be a couple questions on how to avoid catheter-associated infections. Um, we all know that the drainage bag needs to go below the patient, right? You know how many times I've seen the drainage bag on the foot of the bed? At the foot of the bed, patient's laying in the bed, drainage bag is at the foot of the bed. Do we think we're going to drain? The urine has to drain to get out of the bladder. If we retain urine in the bladder, so the Foley's sitting on the foot of the bed, and they're like, wow, we don't have any urine output. Because you're not draining, it's a gravity system. You gotta put it down. So put it on the bed at the hook at the bottom of the bed. Don't put it on the foot of the bed. Transport, that's fine, but afterwards it needs to be lower. I mean, I say that not to be mean or to be, but I've seen the urine on the bottom of the foot of the bed a lot. And I'm like, it doesn't belong there because it's at the level of the patient. Nothing's going to drain. And you'll get an infection because you're retaining urine in the bladder. Retained urine gets infected. Um, super pubic catheters, have you seen these? I just kind of pointing them out in case you haven't seen them. Um, but what do you think the biggest problem with a super pubic catheter is going to be? Infection. But why infection? What do we say? Infection grows in retained urine. Why is this retaining urine? Why is it prone to poor drainage? It's got to come up against gravity to get out. Okay, look at it sitting there and this patient's laying in the bed. It's got to climb to get out. You've got to have a high pressure in your bladder to get out. So sitting a patient with a suprapubic upright so that the bladder can actually drain. If you have the patient sitting, if we turn this picture 180 degrees, it would drain a lot easier, don't you think? So a patient with a suprapubic catheter laying flat on their back is not going to drain. Yes. So why would they do that? To they usually do it for neurogenic bladder. So this patient's a long-term bladder. It's a long-term Foley. Um, why do you think this is a safer long-term Foley than a Foley catheter? The reason? Because it goes through some tissue. And anytime you put something through tissue, there's more chance of white blood cells getting an infection before it gets... And it's not going through a tube, it's going through tissue, and so there's a chance that infection can get killed. We tunnel things through tissue to reduce the chance of infection. So it does have a less chance of infection than a straight urinary catheter, because that's just straight up the tube into the kidney. Um, this goes into the bladder, but it tunnels through tissue, so it is less of a risk of infection, but they are risk of no drainage, and retained urine gets infected. So if you have a super pubic catheter, sit them upright if they can, because... It doesn't drain well. A nephrostomy tube, have you seen patients with nephrostomy tubes? Yes. Nephrostomy tubes sit right here in the kidney. They're called nephrostomy tubes because the tube's in the nephrostomy in the kidney. It's sitting in the renal pelvis there. How much does the renal pelvis hold urine-wise? How much do you think can be held in here? 
Less than 10 cc's. So if we have a tube, why do you think they would put this tube in? Why would we put a tube directly into the kidney? It's the only way out. It's the only way out. Something below the kidney has been obstructed. Maybe you've got a tumor. Maybe you've got something going on. You've got a high stone. Um, there is a reason, but the re we don't want to do it. High, high, high risk of infection. You've got to go straight into your kidney. Bacteria getting in there don't even have to work at it. They're right there in the kidney. You can get a kidney infection right away. Kidney infections, we know, become, um, cause kidney damage and urosepsis. So we don't want them. Um, high, high, high risk of infection, but there's no other alternative. The big thing for this is that it needs to be continuously drainage. Any buildup of more than 10 cc's in that catheter is going to cause kidney damage because any backup into the kidney causes kidney damage. So we want this draining consistently. So you would need to make sure it was draining all the time if you have a nephrostomy tube. They will let you patients irrigate it, but of course you're irrigating, meaning that you are pushing some sterile saline somewhere to help remove a clot. You can do it, but it has to be sterile. You're pushing it into the kidney. So super, super sterile, sterile irrigation and make sure it's no more than 5 cc's because you don't want to cause more problems. Oh gosh, can you imagine if you put 30 cc's into that? <laughs> Damage the kidney straight up. So um, yeah, all that 30 cc's will just backflow right into there and damage these delicate little nephrons, cause explosions of all those little nephron vessels and everything, causes a lot of problems. So we want to be very careful with nephrostomy tubes. Make sure they are always draining, make sure anything you do with them is sterile. Okay? And then I just kind of kind of talked about kidney surgery. Um, you'll probably have a couple of uh, prep you questions on kidney surgery. Um, you can completely remove a kidney. We can do without one. So they will remove it, especially if it's got tumors or anything. Um, sometimes people will donate kidneys for transplant. You can do that. You can help a friend. You can help a stranger. You can donate a kidney. You got extra. You'll make, you know, you won't make more, but um, what they can do is they will actually just ligate the tissue and remove the kidney. They can go and resect the kidney. What do you think the biggest complication is with cutting a kidney? Infection. And it's also a very vascular organ. Lots of blood flow through it. So bleeding, infection and bleeding, your two biggest problems after a kidney. Um, where are the kidneys located? Up here. So if you are bleeding from a kidney, where are you going to see it? You're going to see it up here in the flank, and they call that Turner sign. There's a little T here. And Cullen's sign is abdominal bleeding around the, the umbilicus. You'll see that again when we talk about any abdominal bleeding for any cause. But abdominal bleeding is Turner, color, Turner and Cullen sign. Turner's is flank bruising. So you can see this is a great picture over here of Turner's sign. Look at those. Those are really, I don't know if those are painted on. But this is flank <coughs> bruising here, and this is Cullen's bruising. Those are just signs of internal bleeding. So if your kidney is bleeding, that's where you're going to see it, is you're going to see it um, under the skin there in Turner and Cullen's area. Um, any kind of kidney damage will cause decreased urine output. Um, because we have to go from the front and move um, bowel around to get to the kidney, there's a lot of problems with bowel problems after kidney surgery. And because we are going right here to get at the kidney under the rib cage, you have a lot of issues with trouble breathing and pain with breathing because the incision's right under your rib cage, right at the diaphragm. So they have a lot of trouble breathing after surgery because of where the incision is located. So really those are the big um, post-operative issues. And then I need to show you the diversions. You've probably had stoma care and stuff. Um, we have two kinds. So basically if you're, you need to remove a piece of the urinary tract. So let's say you have cancer. Let's say you bust your bladder in a car accident, which is my biggest fear in the world, is getting into a car accident with a full bladder. Because if you burst your bladder during a car accident, they may have to do a stoma until they can get your bladder repaired and stuff. But I don't know. I have weird 
<laughs> I've seen too much, and so now I have weird paranoia. The other one, public service announcement, never ride with your feet up on the dash. Please, God, never ride with your feet up on the dash. I've seen too much trauma. Do not do it. You know what that does to your pelvis? It breaks it, and you bleed out, and you have a miserable, miserable existence. It breaks your femurs. It is terrible. People ride with their feet up on the dash or their feet hanging out the window, and they get into an accident. What do the airbags do? They crush everything. It is horrible. Please never, ever, ever tell your kids, tell your friends, tell your friends' kids, I stop people at stoplights and I'm like, please put your feet down. And they're like, okay, crazy lady. But please don't do it. I mean, just femurs crushed into pelvis. It's terrible. Don't do it. Um, so anyway, that's just one. Um, so let's say, back to, back to focus, um, we have to remove a piece of your urinary tract that we cannot repair right away. Then you will need a way for urine to get out. Okay, nephrostomy tube's not the best idea, high, high risk of infection. So what they will do is they will make a urostomy. You've probably seen them, especially in a long-term care facility or whatever. You probably see them. Um, incontinent means that we can't control it, right? Just like you can't control pee if it's incontinent. You can't control it, so it needs to have a bag on it. Incontinent ostomies need to have a bag on them. They have a stoma, and you have a urine bag that you can, hey, I sometimes wish I had one, because I'm like, that'd be great. Just dump it, and you're done. It's like having a diaper, man. It's great. Um, Get in an accident with cold water. Well, there you go. And then I've got a stoma. But it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world, because I'm like, hey, then I don't have to worry about it. I just dump it when I'm ready. Um, but the conduit, anything they use to take the ureters and uh, empty them out to the outside is usually a piece of bowel. And that's what they're going to use, a piece of your bowel. They cut and put the bowel back together and use that little piece to kind of connect your ureters to the outside world. Um, so anyway, the ureters are dumped to the outside, and it just pees constantly. As your, bladder, as your kidney makes urine, you dump it out into a bag. Um, a, what are these? So you can see all the different kinds. They, they can put all kinds in there. I don't need you to know the names. I need you to know whether it is incontinent or continent. Those are what we're going to do. If it's an incontinent one, it will require an ostomy bag. Um, so those are the two kinds of incontinent ones. And then there are continent ones where they make a little pretend bladder out of bowel. And they make all these little valves, these little one-way valves. So what this does is it makes a fake bladder for you. Now, does this bladder have a dutricer muscle? And can it contract? No, it's a little piece of bowel that they dilated and turned it into a pretend bladder. It is continent because you can control it. These little guys, the way that they form it and the way that they blow it up, it creates kind of a little valve that closes off. So you shouldn't just leak dribble urine out of it. Um, and you have to straight cap it. Okay. So you can imagine a patient that's 90 years old and has bladder cancer or whatever and can't take care of themselves and living in a nursing home. Which one do you think they're going to get? They're going to get the incontinent one because, you know what, we'll just come in and change the bag every four hours. The patient that has a continent urostomy is doing it for cosmetic reasons. One, I mean, it's a teeny tiny little hole, and they can control it without a bag on their outside. Cosmetic reasons, but they also need to be very compliant with their care to get a constant continent urostomy because that means they've got to go in and cleanly empty out this bladder, this fake bladder that they have. So um, they will reuse their catheters and everything, um, but what they're going to do is they're going to keep them really, really clean. They will clean them in antiseptics. They keep them, they keep them packaged very cleanly, and then they just go into the bathroom, catheterize it, let it dump into the toilet, pull out the catheter, put it in a baggie, and they've got a couple of them that they keep very, very clean. But you can see if you took one and just reused it two hours later straight out of the bag, you can, yeah, I mean, gross, ew. Uh, so if you've got a patient that's not going to take care of themselves properly, this will get constantly infected. And they'll say, you've lost your continent, your ostomy privileges, we're just going to give you a bag. Because we've got to get the fluid out. Um, but this has to be a very um, compliant patient. Um, some of the other issues is, is this is bowel that's making your bladder. And so it like, reabsorbs nutrients that the kidney just got rid of. Because bowel, if it's innervated with blood, absorbs. That's what bowel does, is it absorbs stuff. 
And so when that urine sits in there for a long time, sometimes BUN and creatinine and stuff get reabsorbed from the bowel into the thing. So anyway, but really what I need you to know about continent means that the patient has to self-catheterize themselves and they need to be compliant with their care. Okay. So a patient with continent urinary diversions that isn't self-catheterizing and is or doing it dirty might have to, um, you know, be re-educated on how to take care of their appliance. Um, and then this is kind of stoma care, which you should be hearkening back to block one on stoma care. So if you have questions, there is a thing on stoma care to kind of refresh your brain on that. So that's all I 